Hello again, folks, and welcome back to our third, the third part of our series of Doctoral Mindset. I'm Dr. Marie Bakari. I'm uh, a business and education instructor here at National University. And with me today, I have my very favorite colleague, Dr. Brian Allen. Brian, wow. low expectations. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, Brian Allen, and uh, it is a pleasure to be with you for this third part of our presentation. Um, so let's start out with the fun stuff. Marie, would you, uh, would you start us out with um, uh, conducting a personal SWOT analysis? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, for anyone who has taken business courses, you're probably familiar with uh, the SWOT analysis where you examine an organization and you look for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So what we're recommending here though is that you do it for yourself, do it on yourself um, as a as a way to explore um, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, and where do you have opportunities to get better at things. For example, <clears throat> uh, some of your strengths might be you might be a great writer, but one of your weaknesses might be that you're not a great scholarly writer. So that in itself sets up an opportunity for you to explore uh, scholarly writing, to get coaching on scholarly writing, to um, look at the publication manuals and learn what format uh, they want your work to be in. Um, there, again, it's about self-discovery. What do you know about yourself? What, what are um, the things that you know will work well for you? Where do you need help? Um, and particularly identifying those areas where you need help, that also gives you a roadmap of where you need to go to get the right help so that you can get through this doctoral journey. Um, remember that throughout this process, throughout the doctoral journey itself, you are creating um, or recreating who you are. Uh, you are creating a scholar. You are learning to be a researcher and you're making all this self-discovery. But at the end of the day, you know, you're really doing this because you have a vision for your future and there are things that you want to achieve and you are learning what is it going to take for you to achieve those goals. So starting with a personal SWOT is a good idea, and you might find it very beneficial. Brian, what would you add to that? So, you know, one of the things I think we we often forget is we think we know everything. And then as you begin the doctoral journey, as you begin any educational journey, then you get this, this false notion, well, maybe I don't know anything at all. And, and I, both of these are really errant ways of beginning your thought process about yourself. So when you think about a SWOT analysis for yourself, think about the things that you do know uh, are your strengths. Perhaps your strength is not that you know all of these things, but you know that you have the aptitude to learn quickly and to process information. So that may be your strength. An example of a strength that I think is, is very beneficial to students in the doctoral journey is their strength is they recognize what their weaknesses are. And that is a, that's a telling uh, component of recognizing who you are. If you recognize, hey, my strength is, I know what my weaknesses are, that actually can be to your benefit because it means that you'll start the process in a humble manner. Now, beyond that, don't take, uh, don't take that as your, your soul strength because I guarantee if you've gotten to this point in your, doctor, in your educational journey to be accepted into a doctoral program, there are certainly academic strengths. There, there are um, mental strengths. There are physical strengths, right? There's those, those capacities to get through tough times that are all part and parcel of who you are. So list those. When for me, one of the strengths that I had uh, that I, as I went into my doctoral journey is I knew that I had a foundation of support. So I knew I had my wife and my family to support me. So that was part of my strength. And I use that as a component of it. Now, keep in mind, be honest in your assessment when you run a SWOT analysis on yourself. Now, the thing that I will, I will tell you is it is very easy 
to look at weaknesses and threats and maybe overstate those to a degree. So if, if there is any caution that I could give you in that process is be honest in each of these evaluations, but don't over accentuate any one element. Now, let's talk a little bit about threats, because I think that really leads into the next element and the next process. When you're thinking about the threats to your success in your doctoral journey, knowing who you are, let's be realistic. The chances are we're probably not going to see an end of the world scenario in your, in your doctoral journey. It may feel like it at times. You may get some feedback and you're like, this is it, I'm done, I give up, I'm throwing my hands up and I'm done. But if you understand that the, that the kinds of threats that are likely to be the most common are going to be the common things in your life. They're going to be the elements that take away from time and effort. Um, they're going to be the threats of, hey, I need to support my, my kids or my spouse or my significant other in, this, in a process. And so they are not necessarily a threat against you personally. And so be very careful in classifying anything like that. It's the threats that keep you from being successful in your journey. So as you address what those are, be mindful of the things that are important. That's probably where I would leave it at because every person's threat, uh, every person's SWOT analysis is going to be unique to them. And it's going to be a definition of yourself. Now, I personally think that if you are going to conduct a SWOT analysis, you probably need to meet with a mentor and have that mentor go through that SWOT analysis with you because they're going to give you an honest assessment. And you may classify something as a, as a weakness and they may look at you and say, that's really not a weakness for you. That's an opportunity. Or that's actually a strength and you're, you're underqualifying your capacity for success. So do the conduct the SWOT analysis for yourself. And then I would recommend reaching out to a mentor and um, someone who's going to be honest and fair in their assessment of you. And um, they're going to be as critical as they are positive in their assessment of you. Uh, that's what I would add, Marie. Those are some great tips, actually. Thank you so much for adding to that. Um, I want to move on here and talk about the desired outcome. Um, this is a great picture, I think. And ultimately, along the doctoral journey, this is where um, every person watching this video wants to end up. So, Brian, what would you share with, uh, with our audience here about the desired outcome? It all starts from the beginning. And you have to know what you want to achieve. But I think you almost have to go back to what we covered earlier in our presentations. And that was about knowing what you are a domain expert in. And I think having domain expertise. And so let's talk a little bit about what a domain is and then what it means to be an expert. Now, it is very easy to, um, to claim you are an expert um, and I'm going to use as an example, and I hope you will bear with me. There really is a reason and a logic to this idea. If you've ever had that Thanksgiving dinner with family and you have that crazy uncle um, or aunt, I don't, I'm not going to pick on anybody, right? Um, but it's the one person in your family that they are, topically speaking, they're an inch wide and an inch deep. In other words, they can talk about one thing and it's kind of, over and over that one topic, that one area. And so they have no depth or width to their area of understanding and analysis. Those people are really quite boring. They're kind of, they're kind of boring to hang around and you're like, hey, can I move to the end? Can I move to the kids table? Um, this conversation gets a little boring, right? And then you may have the, the other person in your family. I don't know why I'm picking on families, but we're gonna go with it anyways, because that's where I started, right? So you're going to have that person who is a mile wide and an inch deep. In other words, they know a little bit about everything and they're going to give you an opinion about everything. But when you actually dig a little bit deeper in their analysis and their understanding of any topical area, they fade and they blow away in the wind like 
little dandelions, right? And so they're really hard to 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 focus on. Now, the person that I think is the most interesting is the person that's a mile wide and a mile deep. In other words, they are versed in a lot of things and to a depth that is interesting. And that analysis, the capacity that person has for analysis makes them respective domain experts. Now, does that mean they're a mile wide and a mile deep in every aspect of what they know? Of course not. But there are going to be areas where they are particularly strong, and those are going to be the areas where they are domain experts. And so, for example, let's use a business, since Marie and I both have uh, experiences being business faculty and as business professionals. So um, I have a, a doctorate in business administration with an emphasis in technology entrepreneurship. So I think I could honestly say I have domain expertise in technology. I was a CIO for eight years in entrepreneurship. I am a serial entrepreneur. I've started 10 businesses over the years. Some have been very successful and some not so successful. Thus, the you're, you're seeing real entrepreneurship in action. So I think I could classify myself as a domain expert in technology and entrepreneurship and I'll throw in project management because I have a master's in project management and lots of experience. So those are my areas where I am a domain expert. Maybe expert's a strong word, but we're going to go with it. All right. <clears throat> because I don't know that I know of anybody who's truly an expert in anything except for Marie. She knows everything about everything. Now, um, so, so think about where you are a domain expert. And remember, one of the things we talked about early on is kind of that 10,000 hours of experience or 10,000 hours of learning in a particular area that can help you become the domain expert. So when you're thinking about your desired outcome, so let's go back to the, the folks standing there in their doctoral regalia. For them to get where they wanted to be, they had to know where they started from. If you are a domain expert in accounting, in, and we're using business again. So you're, you have a, a background in business and your domain expertise in accounting is in accounting. It probably doesn't make a lot of sense for you to go and search out, I don't know, project management as your topic for your dissertation because you may not have the expertise there. So think about the long-term success of your doctoral journey from the beginning point. What do you know well? What do you know the language of so that when you go to do your, your critical assessment of the literature that is out there, you know the language early on that creates the foundation and it sets you up for incremental success and your desired outcome at the end. Because at the end of the day, you want to be Dr. What a, insert your last name right here. And that's the end game, right? So start with what you know. Start carefully with what your passion is. Be willing to take your passion, put it on a shelf, and then work at addressing problems with a logical, objective, critical, and scientific assessment, and you will reach your desired outcome. So, Marie, what would you add to that? Um, you know, not a whole lot, but I would say this. Um, many of us are familiar with uh, vision boards. Um, we we may keep journals um, where we document our dreams, what we would like to evolve to become. Um, some of us have uh, legacies that we want to leave behind. In fact, a great number of the students who we work with are first generation college students. Um, so <clears throat> they have the, everybody comes into this with a vision of what they want to come out of this with. Keep that in mind, keep that in the forefront, but understand that it's not going to happen just because you're here. Understand that every step of the way, there is going to be work that needs to be done um, so that you can achieve that level, uh, so that you're ready to join the academy. That's what I'd add, Brian. That's awesome. So let's take us to the next uh, part of this. Um, how about the ethics of the doctoral journey? Would you discuss that with us? I sure will. 
Uh, this part of the doctoral journey is near and dear to my heart. Um, unfortunately, I've seen, um, you know, a the failures when there are failures in ethics in doctoral journeys, and I see the damage that it can do to uh, the human spirit. But why do we bring this up at all? Well, <clears throat> we want you to start strong and stay strong. And understand that you, at every step of the way, you're going to have resources that are there to help you be successful. Um, you have to take ownership of this journey. And this is what we've been talking about all along, you, what role you play in your doctoral journey. So, and as you take ownership, you are also um, self-stewarding. You are um, taking the path um, that you know is the right path, okay? So <clears throat> how do we get you from here to there? Well, we have in every institution, no matter where you are going to school or um, attending university at this point, there are resources available to you. There are people to help you along the way. The doctoral journey is not that of a lonely person. Um, there are lots and lots of people involved. Um, librarians, writing coaches, research coaches, methodologists, subject matter experts, mentors, chairs, editors, all of these people have uh, expertise in their own domains. We've been talking about domains. Um, so it is to you to take ownership of this journey to seek out those um, individuals, those specialists who have the expertise to help you along the journey. Let's talk a minute about logical assessment. Um, you can actually take your body of work and have someone else who's not necessarily on your committee, not necessarily in the university, just a, a good friend, a mentor, someone that um, encourage you to take on this journey and have them review your work because this is a person who's likely to give you that honest opinion and tell you, well, this is good. Um, or, well, I think this needs a little bit more work. Oh, you know what? This part really isn't very clear, but as you get these additional opinions of your work, it tells you where you need to put your, uh, your work, where you need to modify what you're doing, take a different approach maybe. But all of this, remember, is to make you into a better doctoral candidate and ultimately to help you complete this journey. So once you've completed that logical assessment, the very next step is to um, connect with writing folks, and your editors. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to writers and editors. Let me touch on one thing uh, real quick. If you are hiring someone to write this for you, you're not exactly taking ownership of your work, okay? You're, you're having somebody else construct something that you then ultimately, you have to defend this work. And I'm telling you, it's a hard and heavy lift to take something that was created by someone else and, and try to uplift it as if you own it. Yeah, you may have paid them to write it, but ownership in the doctoral journey goes much deeper than just paying somebody to do something for you. Um, there's an element of passion there um, in every doctoral journey, that the minute you engage with someone else to do this for you, um, that passion does not exist. And you know what? Everybody in the world will know when you go to defend your dissertation, whether you own it or not, because that ownership comes through in the presentation and how well connected you are with your topic. Bottom line is, um, you know, it, it's one thing if you're not a good writer and you hire an editor to help improve what you've done. But, you know, fair warning, 
having someone else create a document for you that you ultimately have to defend, oh, that is dangerous territory. Um, and then of course there's a the cost because yeah, you're paying um, tuition. Um, you might be paying fees for books and, and things like that. You may even have to spend money on an editor in the long run, but then to turn around and pay somebody thousands of dollars to create something for you to get your doctorate, you're not really earning it. You have to put in the blood, sweat, and the tears in order to earn that degree. Uh, we've talked a lot in these in these three um, sessions about expertise in your domain. There's nothing greater to give you that expertise than reading deeply about it and then writing about it. Um, those are two skills that when we marry them together, you do become the expert because you know what the literature is saying. And as you've done research around this, you know what the discoveries have been, okay? So continue to develop that subject matter expertise. Okay, so lastly, let's talk about research ethics. Um, research ethics has to do with you doing no harm. We, um, you will learn about the Belmont Report, for example, that's put out, uh, that was put out in, uh, I believe it was 1979, um, by National Institutes of Health. And when you learn about that, you will um, get some ideas about why ethics in research matter. Why do why are we concerned with doing research ethically? Because ultimately we're we're searching searching for the truth, right? And in seeking that truth, you want to do it in a way that is not going to cause harm to anyone, a way that is truthful, and also ultimately in a way that is going to benefit society as a whole or benefit the group that you're um, you're conducting your research on. Um, I want to touch on one last thing, and that's the issue of plagiarism. Um, you hear a lot about plagiarism on a college campus or in a university setting. The importance of not plagiarizing. Remember I talked a minute ago about writing, reading a lot and writing about it? Um, that connection gets stronger when you take make that effort to take a body of work and put it into your own words. When you engage in plagiarism, not only is it bad form, um, not only can you get in trouble for it, not only can it haunt you for the rest of your life, in fact, plagiarism has um, resulted in many a student being dismissed from the universities. Yeah, avoid it, don't do it, but again, when you engage with the work, engage with the scholarship, and then when you put it on paper or on your screen, um, in your words, the connection that's happening in your brain there, there's no substitute for. So along this ethical doctoral journey, consider working with others to perfect your product. Consider working ethically, not just with those who might participate in your research, but with others who you engage with. Um, Ghostwriting, having someone write this for you, not a good idea because you don't own it in the deep way that you need to own your work. Um, and then ultimately do your own work. Believe me, it pays off volumes at the end when you are, able to develop that domain expertise that we've been talking about. Brian, what would you add to this? You know, the first thing that I would add is going back to the discussion of plagiarism. The most valuable skill that you can develop in this doctoral journey, at least in my estimation, is the capacity to research. But secondary to that is to put ideas into your own words, paraphrasing, right? That capacity to to create synthesis, synth good for me to, I'm, I'm having a good word day, synthesis from your own processing of data um, 
is a skill that will pay off in dividends in the long run. At the end of the day, you're going to have a credential that says you are a doctor, which means by extension that you should be able to solve real world problems through your capacity to look at real world situations and the body of existing academic knowledge, provide synthesis from that, and then provide recommendations for solutions to those real world problems. If you've not earned the the skill set, if you've not developed that skill set, you won't be that person and no one will be able to trust your capacity to offer reasonable and meaningful solutions to real world problems. Do yourself a favor, become the expert, put the effort in, paraphrase through your own synthesis, always cite your sources. I can't say that enough. That's incredibly important. You want to give recommendation that you're building your giant capacity upon the shoulders of giants academically and theoretically who have provided their expertise and their synthesis. At the end of the day, that gives you credibility that pays well above what your degree uh, costs you to, to achieve. Now, there are two little areas that I will say that I would add to in this ethical journey. The first is avoid topical research areas that are about revenge on others or revenge upon parts of society that have that you have deemed wronged you or people or individuals or groups or uh, segmentations of society. Avoid anything that is a revenge topic. I'm going to prove this because X, Y, and Z happened to me, my best friend, my mom, my dad, whatever the case may be. At the end of the day, avoid any of those topics. Focus on things that, quite frankly, you're passionate about the opportunity to provide solutions to, but you're objective enough that you can do reasonable and ethical research along the way. Now, the final thing that I would add is there are a lot of the, a lot of students who enter doctoral programs where English is their second language, and they are expected to produce products, a dissertation in English. In those particular cases, you may decide to work with a translator or other writer. If you do that, be mindful that you are still the final author and owner of your document. So with that said, be very cautious in using editors or translators that may not reflect proper translation of what you want to do. Be careful of saying, oh, I'm going to go to Google Translate and I'm going to translate everything. So as someone who speaks a, a number of languages uh, other than English, I can tell you that if I'm to write in Spanish or write in Italian or German, the, I'm still going to... Uh, I'm still going to require the help of someone who's a native language speaker to help me out to go back and make sure that I'm properly uh, and grammatically uh, expressing my ideas in the way that I want them to be expressed. So I think those are the things that I would add that that are really important along your ethical journey. So I'll turn it back over to you, Marie. And thank you so much for for those additions. That's really meaningful. So, um, Brian, <clears throat> I want you to take us through expert expectations, expertise, and finish strong. Let's start with expectations. Don't expect that this going that this is going to be an easy journey. This will probably be the most challenging uh, academic journey you will ever take. With that said. Give yourself a realistic expectation of how long it's going to take. The typical time for uh, completing a doctoral journey is five to seven years. Maybe you maybe you will need a little bit longer. That's okay. Maybe you'll be amazing and uh, you will find that you can collaborate and work your time and complete it in exactly three years and one month. I don't know, whatever that magic number is, but be mindful that have expectations that are realistic to 
your ability to commit your time, what your course load is going to be, what your topical area of discovery is going to be in your research. Think about the expectations of your time and allotment of your time as it relates to learning how to be a domain expert. If you know that you are going in to this process and you are not a domain expert, it doesn't matter. Let's, it, you know, you may have worked in fast food and, and not that I disparage that at all. So please don't take it that way, but don't expect that you're going to go into, um, you, you've run a frontline leader on, and you're the fry cook in your local fast food joint. Um, and that you're going to go into the doctoral journey and you're going to get your dissertation in um, in something deep and theoretical if you have no experience or expertise in that. So be clear about reasonable expectations. Now, the, the next thing is what we've talked about. Try to focus your selection of the degree that you are going to go after, the focus of that degree, and your own experience to help you create the expertise or to have the foundational expertise and understanding to become an expert at what you want to do. At the end of the day, this is about a strong finish. It's about what you set out for yourself as a goal. So be clear and understand who you are. That goes back to the SWOT analysis we spoke about earlier in this presentation. Be clear with yourself and be honest with yourself in your self-assessment. You can finish strong if you have a realistic expectation. But keep in mind that life is mostly plan B. In other words, set a plan, set your expectations, but know that you may have to change along the way. Um, I think Marie and I can clearly say after, and I think we're somewhere around, oh, probably 200 students that we've uh, helped throughout this process as chairs, um, sometimes taking students halfway through the process, sometimes from beginning to end. Um, so somewhere around the 200, maybe 250 students um, through this process. One of the things that I think we both can say is life happens. And when life happens, it changes the plan. Be flexible enough with your plan that you won't fall apart if life falls apart. Keep in mind, at the end of the day, you know what you want to achieve. You start with that from the beginning. But understand that if life circumstances change, you can still finish strong, but reassessing with a new evaluation of where you want to be. And that's okay. At the end of the day, if you complete the journey that you started out and it took you a little longer, that's okay. You're still a doctor at the end of the day. So Marie, what would you add to that? You know, <clears throat> um, as you were speaking um, on the screen, we shared a couple of different stories. Um, there's reality behind all of those stories. Um, both Brian and I have had students who've, oh, they've come up against some of the worst of it. Um, along this journey, there's an element of perseverance that everybody comes in with, um, and it has to be strong enough to see the forest for the trees, so to speak. That is, yes, life is going to get in the way. It always does. Um, even when you were planning to buy your first car or planning to buy a house. It didn't go as smoothly as you expected it would. I'm sure of it, but that's because life happens. Life is going to happen along this journey as well. But if you keep that end, uh, end goal in mind, if you persevere, if you get help from people, this is not a lonely journey. It should never be a lonely journey. Um, work with people, get people to work with you, asking for help. Yeah, we all want to seem like we're the strongest individuals in the world. We're Atlas, the Greek God, right? But no, <clears throat> remember you are a human being. You have feelings, you've got blood running through your veins. Life is going to happen along this journey. Um, let it happen, take stock of it. But at the end of the day, 
um, if you persevere, you do the things that and follow the recommendations that we've given you throughout this uh, three-part series, you can be successful. So, Brian, <clears throat> what if you were to wrap this all up and share your wisest words with the folks watching, what would you tell them? Start with being humble. That is probably the most thing, uh, most important thing in this. Um, you know what? Own it. Own the process. Own your success. Own your failures. They're okay. You're going to have some failures along the way. Those are good. Be willing to pick yourself back up. Use your support system that you have uh, set in place for yourself. If you use that support structure, if you use the folks, and I don't mean inappropriate, right? But reaching out when you need help, when you need to be lifted up, reach out to your chair and say, hey, look, I'm really stuck and I need help. I guarantee your, your chair is there to help you be successful. Now, every chair is different. The relationship with your chair may be different. You may have a chair that is very engaged or you may have a chair that is disengaged and says, you own this journey and you have to do it. At the end of the day, that's true. You still own it. No matter if you have the, the most engaged or the least engaged chair, you own the process of your success and you own the outcome. So own it, love it, hate it sometimes, and then go back to loving it some more because those things will help you to be successful. I would add maybe a little story here. So when I finished my dissertation defense, I had finished writing, I'd done the defense, and at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the defense, I, I was super excited and I went to my wife and I said, hey, I'm a doctor, you get to call me Dr. Allen. And she goes, whatever, Dr. Allen, pick up your clothes off the floor. And I think that really kind of set the stage for, for me personally, because what it did is it reminded me of who I really am. You're going to start this journey and you will change in the process. You're going to change how you think. You're going to change how you analyze things. You're never going to take a statistics from a statistic from the news ever the same again, because the first thing you're going to begin to ask yourself is, what's the sample size? What kind of questions did they ask? How did they select their population? Is it an appropriate sample size? You're going to ask all of those things, and that's okay, because that's the kind of critical thinking you want to have. But at the end of the day, you're still the same person you began the journey, uh, that you began at the beginning of your journey, right? And so be mindful that the people you start your journey with, that you hope to be successful for and be a mentor and an example for, they need you to be humble enough to provide guidance and all of the things you promised you would at the beginning of the journey, once you complete the journey. So I think that's probably where I'd start. I'd probably throw one little idea um, here, Marie, and that is, you know, maturing as a lifelong learner starts, it starts with knowing who you are um, in knowing who to rely on and knowing what you want. But it also stems from the fact that you really want to be a real world problem solver and real world problem solvers have to get grounded. They have to be grounded and they have to remain grounded. And that's grounded in logic and reality. And I think those are the things that I would add, be humble, but be grounded. So uh, what would you add to that, Marie? Take us, take us for a home run. Well, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I'm going to leave, uh, the audience here with a with one of my favorite analogies um at some point along the doctoral journey of every student that i touch i remind them that they're in the car they're behind the wheel they've got control of the gas they've got control of the brake and control of that steering wheel but they still need others they need to build solid relationships with others. They need to build trusting relationships with others. It could be committee members. It could be mentors uh, inside and outside of the university. Um, it could be family, friends, but they have to build relationships to stay strong to finish this journey. But uh, getting back to that car analogy, 
along this journey, your chair, your committee for that matter, are in the back seat and they hold the GPS. So you know where you are right now, you know where you want to go, but how to get there, it's the person in the G with the GPS in the back seat that's gonna help you along the way. So that's probably the most important relationship you wanna build. Nurture it, um, figure out how to work with that person that is going to get you through this process. Listen to them. You don't always have to agree. And when there are things that are, uh, are told to you, whether it's feedback or something in a conversation that you don't quite understand, ask the questions. You have to ask the questions so you can get the answers that you need to keep on going. You know, someone may tell you, oh, you need to turn right and do this. But you may not understand the why. So ask that question. It's a simple question. Why? Ask the question. Because through understanding the why, you can determine what your next steps are. So that's where I would leave it, uh, Brian. Um, it's a heck of a journey. It is so worth it at the end. It's a tough journey. But there, you know, hopefully we've uh, put together a little toolkit to help folks succeed. Excellent. We thank you so much for joining us for this three part, for this third of our three part journey. We wish you the absolute most success in your journey. May it be a rewarding one. And as you finish your program, make sure that you pass it forward. This is our means of passing it forward to those who were mentors to us and helped us to succeed. As you complete your journey, make sure you pass it forward. What are you going to do with your education to make the world a better place and to improve the human condition for those whom you care about and who, those for whom you have the greatest desire for their success and benefit? We thank you again. 